to the Intuitive Insights podcast series. I'm Nina Lockwood, founder and director of Intuitive Interim and Executive Search. Throughout this series, I will be sharing engaging conversations with talented leaders from across the UK transport sector. Hello and a very warm welcome to episode 50 of the Intuitive Insights podcast. When I started, it was the intention of doing five and seeing how we got on. But thanks to your huge support, we're still here and we're still attracting some fabulous guests. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Martin Gilbert, Managing Director for First Open Access Operations, which includes Hull Trains, Lumo and Croydon Trams. I really hope you enjoyed listening to Martin's career story and uh, his three wishes for the future of the transport industry. Martin Gilbert, hello, and a very, very warm welcome to the Intuitive Insights podcast. It is lovely to see you. Hi, great to see you too, and uh, great to be part of the podcast. Well, you're very welcome. So, Martin Gilbert, Managing Director for First Open Access Operations, um, which is a quite a big job. There's a lot going on. And I think from what I've seen in the news recently, it's going to get uh, get even bigger. But we'll start with, obviously, that's the role that you're doing now. But a lot has gone on before that in order to get you to the position that you're into today. And um, the, the Intuitive Insights podcast was set up in the first place so that people could share their career stories, Martin. I think that from the outside perspective, people looking in, um, you know, if you don't want to be a train driver or sell train tickets, then why would you work in the rail industry? Um, Why would you work in the transport industry? And I know because I know you and I know your story that there's such an interesting route that you've taken in order to get where you are today. So in time-honoured fashion, I'm going to ask you to go back, cast your mind back, right to the beginning, and tell me, share your story with us in terms of how you came into the transport industry in the first place, where you've been and what you've done. Um, right through till the role that you're doing today. Great, thanks, Nina. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a bit of a, a sort of circuitous route and, and probably not an orthodox career story, but uh, uh, one that I'm certainly uh, you know, proud of to, to, to have got me to around today with the great team that, that I'm working with in in, a, in the, the very vibrant and exciting world of open access rail operations. So yes, I make myself feel very old now and, and, and reflect and, and realise actually I've been working in the passenger transport industry for, for 23 years. Um, and and I started uh, after I left college, um, so I didn't do university. Uh, I, I, I sort of thought, well, you know, there's two ways to get on um, in life. There's, there's either qualifications or experience, and, and you, know, you can have qualifications as as, as, as you go through uh, your career. So I, I started applying for jobs, um, and 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 was was really fortunate to. Uh, it was the second job I applied for. I got an interview and got the job, which was. Uh, unexpected, but but great, and, and and that was as a trainee schedule compiler for London Underground. So, um, year two thousand, I, I joined uh, them in in their then head office, fifty five Broadway above St James's Park Station, mm-hmm. steeped in transport history, the headquarters of London Transport, as was, um, and joined their their schedule compiler training scheme, which was really brilliant uh, foundations in, in terms of the insight of, of understanding. The timetable and then the sort of duty scheduling and rostering aspects of of a transport operation, because I um, passionately believe that you know the art of scheduling, and, and I'll be very honest to actually say I didn't enjoy it that much. Uh, it's it's it doesn't necessarily play to my strengths, but 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 I absolutely have the utmost of respect and admiration for for those people who do it day in and out, because I, I think they're undervalued. Actually, everything that we do in transport is built on the timetable. That timetable dictates uh, all the resources that we need. And the people and our, our vehicles, be they buses or trains, uh, where our depots are, um, what we've then got to price and then sell and then market and our offer to our customers and, and everything, you know, business performance, operational performance, it all leads back to that all important timetable. And, and I think having a uh, an appreciation and respect for for for, for timetabling because because the, you know the offer is the timetable uh, in, in everything yeah. in, in public transport. So. That, that's where I started my career. I, I very soon after that moved to work for for um, a local independent bus operator where I was living at the time in in, in Surrey, just to the west of London. Um, and and through some evolutions of, of of things there, I sort of worked started as an assistant in the office. I actually started washing buses at weekends, and then wow. uh, left the underground to work for that bus operator uh, full full time. 
um, in the office. Bit of a sort of growth story there. Um, I had a spell running my own uh, small bus company in uh, 2003. So there, there were three of us that got together. I, I was sort of MD and sort of championed the idea of doing it. We got our, our license to operate. Uh, Thames Bus, we were called, based in uh, just outside of Adelstone in, in Surrey. And, and we, we built that business up to, to, to about 14 vehicles worth of work very 14 months for very quickly, which having gone from nothing was was quite uh, something. Yeah. Um, but it was very much dependent on, on county council contracts. And, and we found ourselves in a situation just over a year on that, uh, that, that what was our sort of niche, which was taking on the times of the days that, that other people didn't want to operate. So we had a lot of evening contracts and a lot of Sunday contracts. Right. Uh, Surrey County Council at the time were facing some budget challenges, uh, that old chestnut, uh, and they actually mm. blanket withdrew all evening and Sunday bus services, and it, and it left us oh, as a business wow. in, in, in not the best of places. So um, we ended up selling business. Uh, it, it still carried on and, and, and developed, but under our own steam, we kind of taken it as far as we could and, and with that sort of slight setback. So uh, we got back the money that we invested in the business. Nobody lost out. Everybody kept their jobs. And actually, I was then able to go into a, a bigger organisation um, environment. And, and, and ultimately, the, one of the companies that I then went on to work for was bought by uh, Arriva in, um, I get the timing is right for this, about 2007. Yeah. And we carried on working. Uh, it was a company called Tennis Gold at Miller. We were, we were bought by Arriva, um, and and then one day we had we had a visit from some people from the rail division from Arriva, and they were particularly interested in the fact that my um, part of, of of Arriva's bus division was was very big in doing railway replacement buses and coaches. We oh. of every, every weekend, every evening, we were sort of growing ourselves to be the main operator in in, in that part of the southeast. Um, and they said, "Look, would I be interested in going on a secondment to their rail division to bring some of that bus expertise?" Um, to rail um, because they wanted to improve what they did in that area. Uh, and a six months of comment to, to Cardiff uh, into the offices of Arriva Trains Wales uh, ended up being five years. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I ended up writing the business case to, to set up a new small team within Arriva's rail division to, to manage rail replacement buses and coaches, train crew taxis. Um, and that wasn't just for Trains Wales, that was for, for cross country. Um, and, and then that continued to grow when we were bought by Deutsche Bahn. And uh, we then had Chiltern Railways, Tynemere Metro and London Overground added to us. And we just bought Grand Central. Grand Central is a really important uh, point of my experience in my career because it was open access. And, and I got very excited about what that meant uh, all those years ago, um, which is a, a bit to fast forward to, to today. But be before we do that, um, so, so you know, Arriva was great. Um, and following our acquisition by DB, I actually started getting involved in, in some of the work to bring those businesses all together as a bit of a group because when it was just trains wells and cross country they, they kind of you know, talked to each other and everybody knew they were who they yeah. were then all of a sudden we actually become one of the uh, largest rail groups uh, in the uk at the time and under the leadership of, of my boss bob holland who was our uk trains md i got involved in some project work about how we got all of those businesses to actually talk to each other and share best practice we set up functional forums so ops commercial engineering finance um, customer service uh, and that then fed into bidding so I did a bit of time on their rail franchise bid team um, and, and that that whole experience was, was fascinating in terms of getting a sort of insight into all of the different parts of a rail operation from quite a strategic level so although my sort of operating expertise you know nuts and bolts on the ground depots and drivers and things has, has dominantly been in bus actually yeah. was able to apply some of that with a bit more of a sort of strategic approach to how rail uh, functions uh, and, and and got a really good, strong sort of 360 degree picture of all the different aspects of of, of, of our rail businesses and, that, and how they operate. Um, I actually ended up on a uh, part of the project team for, for the 2012 Olympic Games uh, as a bit of a sort of advisor on their steering group in, in the run up to, to some contracts that our colleagues in bus were delivering yeah. because they used some of our systems and operators from rail replacement days on that. And I actually ended up getting rolling my sleeves up and getting involved in the operation in 2012 at the time. And, and at that point, it kind of reminded me that, you know, I love what I was doing in rail. It was all great. Um, but I was predominantly doing bidding at the time. Um, you know, bidding is is, is quite academic. And, and, and perhaps if I was honest with myself, I, I missed the sort of 
cut and thrust of, of, of day-to-day operations in a real life business so mm. um, I had an opportunity to, to to go back into bus and, and I got my first director level role um, working uh, as initially the commercial director for Arriva Yorkshire that's their bus operation and then I actually then became uh, the director of the business that we bought um, in in West Yorkshire that, that became uh, was, we relaunched it as something called Yorkshire Tiger and what, what Arriva tried to do with that business was buy a smaller business that was operating at a sort of different tier of the market. So it was a sort of low cost unit, lower margin, a bit more focused on on, on contracts and, and, and uh, sort of smaller services, um, but keep it functioning within a PLC level. And it was a great way for Ariva to sort of grow their market in that area. And using all my experience of running my own business some years earlier, and the experience having worked within the PLC, I, I, I was able to help them sort of balance that. How do we preserve all the things that are great about a small um, business that's the local empowerment and ownership and that, that sort of hunger and ambition and entrepreneurialism but also mm-hmm. fit in uh, with, with, with a sort of PLC as well because that had huge fun doing that um, and, and uh, that, that, that went really well and, and, the, and then the phone rang it was my first experience of any recruiters and the phone rang to say oh yeah you're on our radar for all that you're doing in, in Yorkshire we'd like to talk to you about the chief exec role at Reading Buses okay. and, 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 I, and I, I thought well, that was unexpected. Yeah, I've, I've only been back in bus, I think, at this time, just over a year. Um, and, and, and Reading Buses was and, and still is, I think, regarded as one of the sort of uh, you know top tier operators in terms of its reputation, its innovation. Uh, at the time, that James Freeman was the chief exec there. Uh, he was moving to to take on a bigger role in, in First Group. Um, and uh, yeah, I was honoured to have received the phone call. I, I certainly never actually expected to get the job. But then, then when I re- reflected, I thought, well, actually, it's not hugely dissimilar to what I was doing with Arriva in that whilst Reading is owned by a council, which was very different to being owned by a PLC, we were actually quite arm's length with what we were doing in Yorkshire. You know, Arriva were more just a sort of shareholder rather than a sort of day-to-day machine okay. interface. Yeah. Um, and so there were a lot of similarities and actually the size of the business wasn't hugely dissimilar. But I thought, no, look, this is a great opportunity. It's It's, it's next level in terms of the scope of the business, the profile of the business, and and what a honour to follow in somebody like James's footsteps and and, and take on the leadership of, of this very well respected and very high achieving business. Um, and had huge fun doing that for, for for just over four years. I had to move to the other end of the country, back to the southeast uh, in Reading, and then uh, the phone uh, rang again um, with Go Ahead Group, and, and I'd always said. During my time at Reading, you know, if, if I was to ever move back into to, to a PLC, you know, I'd been very fortunate in my career to that point that that everywhere had been a really good, strong cultural fit and and very empowering and, and had enabled me to run the businesses that I'd led as if they were my own business. Yeah. Um, and and of all of the groups at that time, you know, I think Go Ahead was was, was was sort of top in terms of being most admired and, and, and had, had its devolved model, very local, very empowering. Um, and of course, go ahead uh, in the northeast. It's it wasn't, and, and still is one of the largest bus operators outside London. So, big challenge. I've gone from having a team of just shy of seven hundred to, to having nearly three thousand colleagues across fourteen wow. depots, uh, a fleet of just over a thousand vehicles. Uh, so yeah, I, I snapped at the opportunity. I thought, yeah, let's go for this. Let's let's give it uh, uh, my all. It involved me moving to the other end of the country, uh, yeah. to Newcastle, uh, and again, you know, working. But David Brown there, our, our chief exec at the time, great people, great experience, um, had the added challenges of, of, of navigating the, the pandemic and, and, and lockdowns, uh, which uh, was, you know, probably added a few grey hairs and things. Um, <laughs> did a lot of work on, on, on the bus partnership approaches. So we it took that role on against the backdrop of politicians wanting to take control of the bus net, but wanting to franchise and actually was able to say, well, hang on a minute, I've, I've just come from running uh, a council-owned bus operator, the, the sort of thing that you think you aspire to having. And, mm-hmm. and let me tell you that the, the, the approaches to partnership, the commercial realities, they're the same. We just need to be on the same page and be talking together and working together. And, and, and through the work of the bus partnership in the North East, we were able to uh, make uh, our bid to government as part of the bus service improvement plans. And, and the, the North East region got the largest bus service improvement plan settlement uh, of any um, English region uh, yeah. and all that works now being delivered here in the North East. Um, so again, I, I wasn't actually looking uh, to move. 
Uh, mm -hmm. But I got wind um, that uh, there was this exciting open access operation that had just launched in Newcastle. And I thought, oh, open access rail. I, I remember that fondly from from my sort of yeah. writing involvement with Grand Central at Riva. Uh, and I thought, there's so much that could be done with open access. And, and, it, and it has so many similarities to the, the sort of commercial approaches and entrepreneurial spirit of, um, mm. of some of the stuff that goes on in some of the sort of best bus operations in the UK. Um, yeah, I think if we if we look back to the privatisation of of, of you know, British Rail in, in in the mid nineties, a lot of the new approaches were were delivered by some of the, the what people see as bus groups, and that's no yeah. uh, disrespect to, to traditional rail people. Far from it. I, I've learned an awful lot from rail in my first time in rail and taken that into bus. But I think the sort of learning both ways is is a really important part of a sort of modern, vibrant, integrated transport uh you know, portfolio businesses and and so i thought yeah I, I think i could bring something to this and 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 you know i love newcastle i love the northeast of england yeah. uh didn't really want to move and, and here was an opportunity to do something that i've always thought i'd love to have a crack at open access uh and, and for the first time i didn't need to move uh yeah. else and, and so yeah here i am I'm, I'm i'm just over 16 months into the role uh based predominantly in the northeast uh, in the Luma offices, but actually have responsibility for whole trains as well, which is the UK's first open access operator. So I go to Hull uh, quite a bit and, and uh, we've got some business development activities. Everybody will have heard about our plans to extend that to Sheffield. Uh, we've got a team in London. So Stuart, our commercial director, and some of his team are based in London. I work quite closely with them. And they also have uh, Croydon Tram, so tram operations reporting into me as well. So quite a diverse portfolio of, of, of those sort of four parts of what we do with new mobile trains then open access development in terms of what's next with sheffield uh, and then tram so no two days are the same it's very exciting i'm i'm very privileged to have a great team of people uh, around me and um yeah that's where i am brilliant thank you for that um i i love your story i i think that what shines out in every single conversation that i've ever had with you is the passion that you have for what you do and i think that's why you do it as well as you do i am i'm so glad you said it um because i was going to pick you up on it because i don't think i knew that that first role was in scheduling schedule compiler so did it say that on the job advert that you applied for or did you apply for a position and then they said this is what it is did you actually apply for that job i actually applied to be a trainee schedule compiler that was the job title oh. yeah yeah wow. and, and i think you know, I, I, you know I absolutely would you know use loads of timetables to travel around you know as, as people use journey planners now but 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 back then you know in the late 90s and and, and early noughties, you know it was all still you know paper timetables and, and and grids and things so you know I, I knew how to navigate my way around the timetable but i don't think i fully appreciated or respected the, the deep complexities of what goes into to compiling a timetable particularly on a rail system where you know, at least on a bus network you know buses can overtake each other uh yeah. you know, on, a, on, a, on a on a rail line we've we've, we've we're there to, <laughs> Far more Not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I just, young, young. yeah, I can't imagine you in that role. But having said that, so important, as you've said, because the whole system yeah. relies on the timetable. So there are some super, super clever people who do that, uh, which is not to say that I don't think you're super clever. I do. But I think you're also exceptionally entrepreneurial and trying to pin you down to sit you down and do that kind of work I think would be a miracle in itself but and great start though in terms of that career journey to get that really deep understanding of, of how how the thing works because it's so complex so to have that understanding and that level of respect for the people who are doing it has clearly kind of been a, a thread as you've gone through um, and that you know, two words I would absolutely, you've used um, in terms of, you know, the the industry and the the kind of the open access bit in particular, you've just mentioned around the entrepreneurial approach. Mm. And that's what I get in spades from you. Every conversation is, is very much kind of, it feels like it is your, actually your business. It's, you know, it's you're running it as if it was your business in a very entrepreneurial way. And I think you're also uh, one of the pe people that I know um, a huge amount of respect for the way you do that with respect to the rules and the you know how we have to operate 
but an ability to see the bigger picture and the art of the possible beyond those perceived boundaries that we're working in. No, oh, thank you. And yeah, and it, I think it's it, it's one thing having the empowerment to be able to do that. It, it, we, we also step up to the market, you know, with the team here to, to, to have to have that accountability and responsibility as well. You know, we, 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 we're not. Yeah, they, we're not we're not subject to a government contract with a cap and collar mechanism that if it all goes wrong, you know, something steps yeah. in and saves it all. You know, we get this wrong, we all we all suffer, and, that, and that's exactly how things are in 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 the bus sector. And I think that that that's some of the commercial differences, perhaps, between bus and rail. But but open access, you know, we we very much live or die by the consequences of our decisions. And and, and whilst the model is hugely empowering, and I find it hugely motivating, uh, equally. What comes with that is is a huge degree of, of, of accountability and responsibility as well. And, and, and the team here, you know, I'm, I'm best of a really, really good team across all the businesses that I look after. Um, you know, we get that and, and we don't take that for granted. Yeah. And that I think, you know, everything I see, whether that's on, you know, the stuff that you post on LinkedIn, the stuff that comes out on Twitter, both from Hull Trains, from Lumo, from you personally, from Jen, everything is just so super positive, even when it's not going right. And you're very visible as a leader and, and as is Jen Clare. You know, you, you, you're both out there. You're on the front of it. You know, yes, it's we, we apologise. It's not gone right today, but this is the reason and this was what we're doing. So I think you're doing a brilliant job and I love seeing what you're doing out there and the different developments. And um, I loved the piece that was out a couple of weeks ago with the red carpet, with the trolley coming oh. down the platform. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. loved it. It's just, <laughs> yeah, it's great. Really, really kind of captures the imagination. It's brilliant. Oh, thank you. Um, it is a team effort, and yeah, we've we've got Lou Lou who Lou Mendham who runs uh, whole trains day to day as well. You know, and again, I'm I'm blessed with with Jen and Lou. We've got Ben at, yeah. at Tram. You know, they they they're great. Uh, you know, number twos to to to, to what I try and you know bring to, to what we do. And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it doesn't always go go right, and that's great to hear you say that. But you know, even you know, we we're certainly not shy of putting ourselves out there when when there's been challenges. You know, if we Definitely. if we have disruption. We're out. We're out there. We're, we're helping support our customers, and we're, we're very realistic and honest about it. Because you have to be if we're going to learn from things and improve. Even challenges that aren't you know, of our making, some of the infrastructure yeah. challenges that that, that that passenger operators face on the railway, you know, they're still our customers at the end of the day, and, and, and we have to make sure that we, we support them the best we can through that through good communications. It's been really good that you know, not good that we had the situation in the first place, but we've had we've had a couple of you know not very good. Um, you know, periods of disruption. You know, actually, we've we've had, we've had some letters of praise in uh, about how our team have handled wow. things, um, and I think you know that 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 leading by example, but also giving people the the empowerment to go out there and do the right thing. That that that's now starting to show from 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 what we get there out there on the front line. Yeah. It's it's yeah. just so brilliant. It's just great to watch. It's just brilliant okay. to watch how you're doing it in terms of that whole the stakeholder engagement piece and and ultimately the the very key stakeholder being the customer um so i'm i'm loving watching it um i am i'm really interested in terms of this this kind of next bit of our conversation i'm fascinated to know if you if you ruled the world martin if we put you right at the top of the industry and said right okay martin you can change three things you can have three wishes for what you would want to change in the UK, well, you can have transport if you want to go wide. You can keep it down to rail, whichever works best for you. Um, what would you change? If we could change three things tomorrow, what would they be? Uh, so that's a big, tall order. Uh, you know, <laughs> there, there, there'll be people out there who are much better placed to answer that than me in terms of ruling the world. But uh, but but if, I suppose three you know, quick ones that, that spring to, off the top of the head that spring to mind. I mean, I mean yeah. The, the world is still not normal out there at the moment. We've we've, we've got a rail industry that, that that's on a sort of you know hybrid arrangement in terms of of, of the contractual footing. With 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 a degree of uncertainty about what the future of, of structure looks like. That that's still not clear at all. But I think it's very it's a real shame that at the moment the industry is not able to exercise its, its sort of commercial um, entrepreneurialism. You know, it's it, 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 and, and innovate for for, for customers. It, it wasn't that many years before the impact of, of of the pandemic and lockdowns that actually the UK rail sector was seeing, you know, world leading levels of of, of growth and, and and you know cost efficiency and and and, and also the it's great safety standards and, and all of that has been achieved uh with with you know the right sort of approach between government and commercial operators mostly 
Um, and I think that the commercial operators have still got a lot more to, to, to bring to things. So, yeah, yeah number one, we, we've got to get back to bringing in that, that sort of commercial um, empowerment and entrepreneurialism because mm -hmm. uh, the operators and, and, and the managers in businesses are closest to their customers and their markets um, and, and can deliver for them. Um, but they're not actually able to necessarily do that yet under the current contractual framework. And look, I know that message has been... Um, you know, is, is is well communicated by 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 many people um, at, at minor and more senior levels as well. And, and I hope that with whatever the future uh, of of government and rail reform looks like, that that we can get that important piece um, back into things. Um, I, th I think the second one is that you know we, we we sometimes get a bit snobby about the detail of things sometimes these days. And 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 yeah, it's really great that we've got people joining the sector from from and there is the again both of these comments apply to, to, to bus and rail um from from outside the industry there just needs to be a balance and 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 and, and, and a respect i think for, for for good old traditional nuts and bolts operations you know somebody yeah. that can uh yeah in, in a bus depot context uh relate to drivers booking on at half past four in the morning on a cold windy wet day when the yeah. heaters aren't working on the bus or it needs jump starting or or, or at a or our, and, and our customers that are at bus stops or, or, or railway stations, you know, in, in, in darkness on, on freezing cold days waiting for, yeah. you know, services that are running late or that there's poor information. Or, and, and, you know, and, 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 and the people that have a, have a respect for operating detail are the people that can sort out some of the pain points and challenges that are, I think, at yeah. the moment undermining some of the delivery of services out there. So, so brilliant. We need... The new thinking in terms of technology, the new thinking in terms of uh, you know, um, uh, you know, all, all, all of the, the sort of modernising of the sector, uh, because it is a bit traditional and old fashioned in in many places, and it and it does need uh, you know some 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 sort of progression and change. But we have to make sure that we don't lose uh, our ability to focus on the right detail. To actually deliver our services, because it is the delivery of our services yeah. which is what we are a business. Yeah. So, so I think I think I would just you know, one of my wishes would be that we uh, we we as much as we have progression uh, 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 and evolution as an industry, we also don't forget the basics. We need to get back to brilliant yeah. basics, and I'm not I'm not sure we're doing that as a sector universally yeah. across both bus and rail. I, I think we. Uh, don't have the balance right, and, and, and that sometimes we, we lose sight of the basics. And, and I think that they are the foundations of what we do. Absolutely, uh, I think can, what we, we what we could do better as well, linking into what you're saying there. Certainly, from from our perspective, when we are looking at operational roles for clients, we're not we we need to get better at growing our own. Absolutely. So we're not Absolutely. doing, you know, so many people I've spoken to just just kind of through this podcast, you know, they'll tell me, well, I joined as a, as a graduate of British Rail Days and I went around all of these different functions and I learned how to do this, that and the other. And, and people were taught how to run the operational railway. And I don't see that level of encouragement to get people to do that there's almost a kind of if you if you like operations then great but i'm not i, I would love to see some more encouragement when people mm. join the railway to get them to realize that everything rests on the operational railway and yes we need innovation we need entrepreneurialism we need to be commercial all of that but if the railway isn't running properly mm -hmm. then it doesn't matter or if the bus service isn't running it doesn't matter everything else will fall out so i'm definitely with you on that one i'd like more yeah, focus uh, on building operational skills <laughs> it, 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 it's so important and and, and you yeah, know look not expecting everybody to want every single ounce of detail but but we need the right people on the right level of detail and, and it's tough, but and I, it doesn't, you know, running a, a railway, which is very time and date critical, you know, and a bus operation, very time and date critical um, in, environments uh, that, that, you know, if working in a supermarket, we can we can we can cope with running on a couple of, uh, you know, fewer tills. We could we call you in office. We might be able to do tomorrow's task tomorrow, but we can't run today's train or bus at, at, that, that's got commuters or school children or whatever on tomorrow we, we have to run it today at that time to be done today. Yeah. Uh, and, and and so that's a huge 
uh, responsibility. It's 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 in many cases twenty four seven. You know, we, we we sometimes do have to stop things over an evening and take phone calls and get involved and sort things out. But that is the nature of a time and date critical railway system. And I know that doesn't always fit with you know modern aspirations of work life balance and and so yeah. on and so forth. But but the rewards for doing it, I, I think, are huge. You know, we we are really important public services and are absolutely critical to to, to, to the economy and and, and, and and health and social and education uh, in, in society so you know it's it's a, it's a real I've used the term jobs with purpose before you, you, you're doing really important oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so yeah so I think that would be my second uh, wish is, is is to get that that, that balance right and restore that sort of back to basics detail and then I think the third one is is we just need to you know I've written it down as be kind it's a bit of a broad topic, but but yeah, there's so many challenges in the world today. You know, people are, are digitally connected through things like social media. You know, twenty four seven. It's it's too easy for people to sort of you know table their controversial views or take a pop at people and all the rest of it. And 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 you know, actually, it, it just needs to. Yeah, I think I think very few people come to work to deliberately do things wrong or or, 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 or mess things up. And, and, and actually, there's, there's a lot of people out there who are too quick just to still sort of, you know, criticise things and, 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 and not stop and, and, and think about, well, hang on a minute, has, has that person really set out to, to, to get that wrong? Are they really, have we really set out to disrupt people's journeys this morning? No, we absolutely haven't. Yeah, we actually we actually really painfully feel it when we do and we're, we're, we're distraught when we have. Um, you know, challenges that, that impact customers. And, I, and I'm sure, you know, 99% of the people that work in this this industry believe, you know, have the same ashes and ethos. So I'm not suggesting that people shouldn't be held to account or shouldn't criticise far from it. We, we need all those things. But, but, but you know, there's a lot of um, a lot of challenges out there in the world these days. And, 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 and I don't think, you know, people are too... Yeah. There was a time during the pandemic when people started talking about the concept of being kind and actually kind of just stopping and, and, and thinking before they were you know, quick to criticise. And, and, and I think we've kind of lost that uh, again. And, and, and it's, it's way too easy for, for, for negativity, negative feedback um, to, to come across people's devices, you know, desks, heads, lives. And, 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 yeah. and, and, and that, that, that gets in the way of people doing uh, good. So, yeah, if I, was, if I was in charge of things, they're, 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 they're the sort of, you know, my free... So sort of things that I would like to focus on changing. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Martin. Um, final question from me mm. um, is in relation to your um, seemingly boundless energy. You know, yeah. I've referred to the stuff that I see, and obviously social media, we've just talked about one aspect of it, but the other aspect is that we see all the good stuff. Um, but we all have days um where we're kind of our energy level might drop a bit motivation level might drop a bit there might have been one too many challenges and it's kind of like and you've got to seek inspiration from somewhere where do you go for your inspiration when you need a bit of a kick up the trousers to get you going again where do you seek your inspiration wow um well, thank you. First of all, for I, I don't necessarily have boundless energy. I, I, I do. I do stop at, at some point during the week and uh, <laughs> you know, just pause and take stock. Um, but I think you know, loving what you do helps, and, and you know, I'm very fortunate to to work in a sector that that I absolutely love. Uh, I've mentioned working, you know, being fortunate to work with some great people as well. I mean, I'm I'm the first person in my family to to drive a car, so we went everywhere when I was a kid on the bus and the train. So I do have, I do have a bit of an interest in the sector. I'd like to think it's a healthy interest. Um, you know, day to day, we are we are a business, and we have a responsibility for our customers and and, and our colleagues, and, and 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 they're probably the two two aspects that that really drive me and and, and keep me motivated, and, and that when things aren't, you know, sometimes not not you know where we'd want, that I actually sit there and think, well, you know, how do we make a difference? Making a difference is what really yeah. motivates and inspires me. So, you know, improving the quality of our service for our customers, you know, making a slight tweaky it might be something really minor it might be a change to something on the catering menu on the trolley on the train or something it might be an yeah. extra piece of information we put out on social media or, or or you know most importantly some of the stuff that we've done to enable our colleagues to deliver even better uh, service so so i think they're they're the things that i draw my energy from is making things you know to change it's, it's people isn't it it's, it, it's all yeah. about people but but beyond that i mean having a i'm very fortunate to have a good network of 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 of, of 
um, you know, people who I would regard as friends who I've, who I've worked with in my previous career, and some of them have been, you know, unofficial mentors or champions, probably, if I reflect on it. But they, they've never called themselves that. I've never called themselves that, but that's mm. probably what it that's is. What they're being. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and having the ability to pick up the phone to them. You know, I mean, I'm still in touch with my very first boss uh, on the underground. Um, really? He's, okay. he's long, long retired now, but, you know, um, uh, Mark, you know, shaped a very inspirational part of my career actually did a little bit of of, of work outside of his job on the underground when, when i was running my own small bus company he was right. part of part of that as well you know i still talk to people like mark I still talk to people as well literally in pretty much every role i've had i'm still in touch with my one of my former bosses there and and and, and that's that's great to be able to pick up the phone and just say yeah i had this today it's you know and just reflect on it and bounce some ideas around in a safe environment and, and get people's views um is 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 really um good as well but but yeah, yeah we in in those rare moments of you know the situations that you, you stress there i suppose also just just taking 10 steps back and just stopping and pausing and actually reflecting on some of the things that that, that you've achieved or that the organization that you're leading yes. has achieved yeah. bring that sort of you know pride uh, back into things so in, so in Lumo's world it's it's making sure you're at the window at the right time of day while the trains is going past and, yes. and, and sitting there and watching it and there yeah it's yeah. on time because we've got high bright blue yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. And, 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 and she smiles and sometimes I'll tweet about that just just randomly just to say great day Newcastle day yeah here's one of our trains or, or in Hull yeah. walking down to the station because the office is just up the road from the station and seeing the departure of one of our services mm. um, you know or on tram using the tram from or in the Wimbledon station to get to our offices. Um, you know, it's, it's seeing the actual thing live and running with 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 people and colleagues is 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 is, is a great, yeah. uh, energizing thing to, to see yeah. and do, and, and something to be proud of. Yeah, we um we have a thing at intuitive like the whole team know that I'm I'm passionate about this is that we 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 have a kind of um central point I individually but i have a, a folder in my in my outlook which is what i call my smile file so on those days when it's kind of flipping nora we're pushing water up a hill here um you know you have some days not very many of them but you know when you when you hit some challenges and for me going back and having a look at the things our clients say, the things our candidates say, some of the photographs of stuff we've done, you know, and, and the impact that we make. That is that's definitely for me exactly what you're saying. It's kind of remind yourself of all the stuff that has been achieved, even though there's always still a list of lots that has oh, to be still to be done. Remind yeah. yourself that you've actually done quite a bit already. Um, brilliant. Thank you. No, thank, thank you so you. much um i always enjoy our conversations today was no exception i've loved that whistle stop tour through your career um still reeling up the fact that you were a scheduler um because <laughs> i would never ever have approached you for that kind of role right. yeah, um yeah. so yeah fascinating loved it thank you so much thank no, you for your three wishes some brilliant thoughts there um and some good advice in terms of where to find inspiration from so martin gilbert thank you so much for joining you. me no problem it's been a pleasure to talk to you as well thank you nina thank you my huge thanks to Martin for taking the time out of his exceptionally busy schedule to join me on the Intuitive Insights podcast to share his career story, his three wishes and his, uh, his inspirations. I hope you enjoyed it. Please do like, subscribe the podcast and um, join us again for the next one uh, when we'll be sharing more career stories of senior leaders in the UK transport industry. Thank you.